good morning, Calvary Assembly. Welcome to Church Online today. We are a church that values worship. We believe in not just singing songs about God, information about God. We believe in singing to Him and straight to His heart. He's our Father. We believe that He's good. We believe that He wants to meet with every person uh, who seeks after Him. So this morning, if you're in your house, if you're watching this online, uh, why don't you stand uh, to your feet today and, and let's do this. Uh, maybe if your kids or uh, your spouse are next to you today, grab their hand and together, let's just take on a body posture of invitation. We're inviting the Holy Spirit to come and rule, to move in our worship today. In the scripture, it says that he inhabits the praise of his people. We want God to come and live in the way that we respond to him today. Let's do this. Let's just take 15 seconds to open the doors of our hearts because we know when he moves, he is the final authority over everything that holds us back, over our fear, over our depression, over our sickness, over our physical needs. We know that the name of Jesus is the final authority. So come on, let's just keep on leaning in for a few more seconds. Let's welcome him today and we are going to give him glory that is due his name. Where we hear worship, we hear. 
we sing this last song today, let's just stand in awe and in reverence of the God of creation, of the God of salvation today. Let's lift our heart and our worship unto him.
on the hill you created the light of the world abandoned in darkness to die come on but that's not the end let's sing the victory song today and as you speak a hundred billion failures disappear where you lost your life so I could find it here come on we sing if you left the grave behind your soul I, I can see your heart and everything you've done every part designed in a work of art all along if you blindly chose of Christ this morning and everybody said amen well thank you for joining us for worship today we're about to get started with our message in just one minute well good morning and thank you for tuning in and joining us here today we are in the midst of a series called sanctifying your home and uh, basically, we were talking about how we can become more like Jesus. And I want to start by asking you a question. And that question is, what is your favorite social media platform? I know that for me, my number one has to be YouTube, just because you can seemingly learn anything and everything at the click of a button. And uh, so, or maybe you don't really consider YouTube a, a social media, you're more a, a traditionalist, if you will. My, my other favorite of kind of the more uh, socialized platforms where people interact even more so would be on Instagram. I can definitely lose track of a half an hour of time scrolling through my favorite comedians or meme pages or all sorts of stuff. It's easy for me to get lost in the mix on those things sometimes. And I really have a love-hate relationship with social media, to be honest. Like, there's times where I feel like so many people are just trying to portray an image of who they want somebody else to think they are. And that part, to me, is exhausting and draining. But there's also some really good things that can happen through social media, even some of the changes we've seen in the last season of people advocating for justice and for equality. And so I'm grateful for what, how God and how us as people can use it. But I really do have this love-hate relationship with it. And the thing with social media is it's largely a, a passive experience. I mean, mostly what, what you're doing is you're consuming somebody else's comment. Maybe you're, you know, sending some messages or commenting, but it, it's a broadly passive experience. So if you're going to follow somebody, it's as simple as the click of a button. And now you can follow your favorite person, celebrity, sports star, whoever you would like. But the way that it works in following Jesus is a completely different use of that word. Following Jesus, the way he describes it, is not just praying one simple prayer. No, it's, it's much more intense than that. The way he describes it is, pick up your cross and follow me. 
So it's no joke of a commitment to follow after Jesus. My, my, one of my favorite theologians says this. He says, followers of Jesus follow Jesus. His name's Scott McKnight. Real deep thought, I know. Followers of Jesus follow Jesus. Of course, it's very simple, but the actual practice of it is incredibly challenging in our lives. It's not so simple to follow Jesus sometimes. And I'll tell you this, for, for me, the topic we're going to talk about today is forgiveness. And forgiveness is incredibly difficult and incredibly challenging. But I believe that God's word has something fresh and active and alive by the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe he is going to speak to us today. So we are going to look at the book of Matthew chapter 18, and we are going to go to verse number 23. And before we jump into that, I want to give you a little bit of context. So Jesus is talking with one of his closest friends and followers. His name is Peter. And Peter is asking Jesus a question. He's saying, how many times if somebody has wronged me, if somebody has sinned against me, how many times, Jesus, should I forgive them? And here's the thing of it is, you know, Peter's trying to take a guess. Like, how many times would that be? Would it be like once, twice? So Peter says, how about seven times? And Jesus responds to him. And he says, it would behoove you, you are to forgive 70 times, seven times. In other words, forgiveness upon forgiveness upon forgiveness. But I don't know about you, but this is incredibly difficult and challenging in our lives. Like, like if you've been actually hurt by somebody, it's really, really challenging to let go of that, to not write that person off to not become so embittered or enraged with them. That has happened repeatedly in my own heart, in my own life. And so this morning, before we jump into the passage, I actually want to have you, if you haven't already, think about, is there somebody who you have not been able to or haven't even desired to forgive? Who is that person or a couple of people that no matter how hard you've tried, you have not been able to release it. I want you to think about that situation, and then I want us to engage with the scripture. So remember, Jesus has just answered Peter and says, you're supposed to, to forgive over and over and over again. Here's where we pick up, Matthew 18, uh, verse number 23. It says this, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servant saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servants just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is an intense passage of scripture. 
It's a parable, a story that Jesus is telling. And I want to break it down for you today because there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of interesting things happening here. So you've got the first servant, and he owes the king 10,000 bags of gold. Or another way that it could be translated would be 10,000 talents. And the amount of debt that this would be is somewhere around 730 million workdays for this person. In other words, this is an insurmountable amount of debt. It's just a ridiculous number. If you were to try to put a financial number on it, it would be somewhere between five and $500 billion. So this, this is an absurd amount of debt that this first servant has to the king, to the master. And he goes to him, and originally he just says to him, hey, would you just be patient? Just give me a, a little bit of time. Which, of course, is an, a, a ridiculous claim. Like, you don't need just a little bit of time. You need 730 million more days to be able to pay this off. Like, this isn't going to happen. But the king actually says to his servant, you know what? I'm going to have pity on you. Not, not like on a looking down on you way, but I'm going to be merciful to you and I'm going to forgive you. And so all of that debt is wiped clean. So now that first servant is interacting with the second servant we meet in this story. This second servant owes him 100 denarii. A hundred denarii is approximated by uh, biblical historian Michael Wilkins to be around 400 bucks. So $400 is not an inconsequential amount of money, but when you compare that to five or $500 billion that he was forgiven, it's a drop in the bucket. It's ridiculous. It's such a small number comparatively. So that first servant who was forgiven so much, he turns around to the person who owes him $400, and he goes berserk on this guy. I mean, he doesn't just say, you owe me. And, and back in the day, if you owed somebody like that, you would become a slave to them. And sometimes it wouldn't just be you. It would be you and your wife and your kids. Your whole family becomes a slave, especially for the amount of money that that first servant owed the king. It would have been his whole family going to be slaves but he was forgiven. But now that same person who was forgiven so much is in a situation where somebody owes him a small amount of money in comparison, and he goes nuts on this guy. He grabs him by the neck. He starts physically assaulting him and saying, where is my money? Are you kidding me right now? You owe me 400 bucks. He, he throws him into jail, He's, which, which at that point, he could never even repay that debt back. He's not even going to be able to work. He is so much more adamant and harsh in his consequence to the second servant than the king was even to him over $5 billion. See, he was forgiven so much, but then he did not forgive a small amount of money. So then it gets to verse 31, and the, the, the other servants of the master of the king are saying, hey, this isn't right. They tell the master, they tell the king, and they say, did, did you hear what this guy did? You forgave him $5 billion, and now somebody owes him 400 bucks. He won't do a thing about it. And so the king says, okay. The way that Jesus in the Bible describes this person's heart, the first servant, is wicked. This person is wicked. Like that's just wrong, flat out wrong. And so now the consequence and the punishment that he originally deserved but didn't get now comes his way. Now is where the hammer drops on that first servant. And it's not because the king and the master wasn't merciful or gracious in the first place. It's because that first servant chose how he was going to live out his life. He was not going to live a life of forgiveness. He was going to lash out even worse and even harder. And then he chooses where he is heading on his path. So what does this whole parable mean? I mean, parables always have several different meanings and takeaways that we can look at, but it kind of comes to a head at the very end here. It says this, 
Jesus says, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. You see, Jesus right here is establishing what his kingdom looks like. It's not the same as how we think about it, how we think about it in our culture. Instead, Jesus is saying, you have been given so much grace. He has been given, this servant has been given so much mercy, and yet nothing is even changing. And Jesus is inviting us to, to live counterculturally, to live as a transformed heart. You see, when we give our hearts and lives over to Jesus, the old is gone, the new has come. We accept and we receive grace, we receive mercy, and then we pass out forgiveness because it's out of a heart of gratitude that we have experienced. You see, our culture is going to say, I will get what I am owed, but Jesus says, I am here to set you free. You realize that with, with forgiveness, it is, yes, about forgiving that other person, but it's also about you and what's going on in your heart and how it affects your life. See, our culture is always trying to say to us, you know, I'm going to get what is mine. I'm going to get what I deserve. When you wrong me, I, like revenge is ours. Payback is a, a coming <laughs> is, is the way we would say it. Someone has wronged me, so I am going to get even. I remember a, a few years back, I had somebody who lied about some things that I had said. They said that uh, I had said some things that I never said. They twisted some things, and they, they, they were a friend of mine, and they said it to other close friends of mine as well. And I remember I originally found out from another friend who said, hey, did you say this? I said, no. Where did you hear that? Like, and that's how I found out. And so I got really, really mad because here's somebody who is lying to my friends about something I never said. So I am ticked and not, I didn't respond with, man, I want to go and resolve this with my friend. No, my first thought was, do you realize how much dirt I have on this person? I could sink their ship right now with all the junk they've done that I've never told anybody that I know about. And that was where my heart and my mind went at first. And I'm not proud of that, but that's, that's where it went. And, and the Lord had to work on my heart and say like, whoa, whoa, pump your brakes here. Like, the goal in a conflict like this is reconciliation, not to try to get even. There's a countercultural way that we are invited to. Our world says, I'm going to get even. Jesus says, I'm going to set you free. But here's the question we always end up wrestling with when it comes to forgiveness is how do I do this? Like, Jonathan, I've tried this before. Like, I've prayed the prayer. I've thought the positive thoughts. I've done all the things. But here I am. I, I still can't seem to forgive. So how do we do it? It starts with this. Number one, it starts by receiving God's forgiveness. And it starts by looking at your own life. You see, you have to look internally to realize how, how wrong and how sinful and how dark your own heart can be. I'm not even talking about the world and others. And like that exists too. And there's systems of oppression and all that, all of that exists. But there's darkness that lives and dwells inside each and every one of our hearts. And we've got to dig down deep and realize how big the debt is that we dug for ourselves when we have turned our back on God and his best every single time. Because you have to know God's a holy God. He has a standard of perfection and we haven't led up to that. So now we've got this debt. We can't come before a perfect holy God because we have messed up time and time and time again, you and me every single time. But this is why Jesus came back for us. It was to forgive us and it was to set us free. 
And this is the greatest news we could ever come to hear. This is the gospel that we got what we didn't deserve. We were given mercy by the blood of Jesus. We are forgiven and we are set free. So it starts with God's forgiveness and then it moves into us extending that forgiveness to other people. It, it, it starts by us receiving first, and then we can release that forgiveness unto others. You see, we have to recognize we have been forgiven so much, so now we can forgive so much. And this changes everything for us. God is inviting us not to live like the first servant and be so forgiven by God, but then not be able to forgive our own brothers and sisters for their offenses that they have had against us. We are a forgiven people, so we extend mercy by the power of the Holy Spirit that lives and dwells inside of us. I remember uh, after the last message I spoke, I had uh, one of the young adults in our church text me, and she actually gave me permission to be able to, to share this story. But she talked about how her, uh, her, she, she, she could not forgive somebody who had wronged her sister. It was her sister's ex-boyfriend. This person was a, a main church leader, and so she thought he was going to treat her well. He treated her horribly, and it, it ended bad. And I don't even know all of the details, but I know that for this young girl, she had said, I have tried over and over and over again to be able to forgive, and I just can't. So, like, what do I do, Jonathan? Well, two thoughts. Number one, first off, I'm just grateful that we've got college kids, young adults who are asking these kinds of great questions, that they've found a safe place to actually grow and engage the real parts of their faith and the messiness that we find in this world. I love that, number one. But number two, how many of you know that, you know, when it's, it's one thing if you wrong me, but it's another thing if you wrong somebody I love. Like, it's even harder for me to be able to forgive somebody I love so deeply, my wife, my kids. Like, have you ever been there? Like, that's, that's what it's like for me. That's why if I ever run into a mama bear, I'm headed for the hills. Hide your wife, hide your kids, save yourself. I'm out of here if I see mama bear coming out because I'm not messing with that. But maybe this is where you find yourself, just like this young adult from our church asking this question. Jonathan, I want to forgive. I want to live how Jesus has called. I understand he has forgiven me so much and I'm so grateful for that, but I just can't seem to let this go. I feel you. I've been there. And here's what I want you to know is there are practical ways that we can talk about today where you can implement forgiveness in your life. And, and honestly, maybe these are ways that you need to just do one of these. Maybe you need to do a whole variety of these. But I want to get intensely practical now with you for how you can cultivate a life of forgiveness and be free. Here's the first thing, is I want to invite you to own what happened. I, I, don't, I don't want you to pretend like something wasn't that big a deal. No, that offense, that wrong against you, it was a big deal. And here's the deal, sometimes we can't, we can't just go around a thing. We need to go through a thing and we need to go deep. We need to deep dive into it, how it really affected us, how it really made, made us feel. And the, the thing about forgiveness is forgiveness is not just pretending like everything is okay. No. In fact, sometimes it means you need to go confront somebody's unhealthy behaviors. And you need to say something to somebody of like, hey, this is how you made me feel when you said this or when you did this or when you didn't do this. And sometimes we need, sometimes forgiveness looks like uncomfortable conversations. But maybe that is what needs to happen. Sometimes there are just straight toxic people in our lives that we need to get free from and we need to create space in. 
Forgiveness is not denial. Forgiveness doesn't mean forgetting either. Forgive and forget. If, if you try to pair those words together, that's, that's ridiculous. That is, that is not how it works. God is not calling us to have some sort of amnesia and call that forgiveness. Forgiveness doesn't forget what happened, but forgiveness means letting go. It means I'm not going to let this grip my heart for one moment longer than it needs to. I'm not going to let this affect who I am becoming, who I am in Christ. Which leads to my second point, which is sometimes we need to talk to somebody. Sometimes we need to get counseling. And church, can we just erase the stigma around how that is bad? You know, we, we think like, oh, you have to be so down in the dumps to be able to go get counseling. Like it's some form of weakness. Counseling is not weakness. Counseling is strength. And, you know, I, I know for myself, I had, I had a coworker back in the day who wronged me. And, and I just, it kept swirling in my head. And, and I just couldn't release it. And like, they didn't seem to care at all, which was part of what was so frustrating for me. And, but eventually... I just said, I, I feel like I need to talk to somebody because it's like stewing in my mind and I don't want it to be in a, I, I just can't get it free. And I talked to a counselor for a couple of sessions and man, did it help. I'm telling you with that, with the, with the, with the power of that and prayer, I was able to release it. And now I can honestly say it has no grip on my heart and in my life like it did before talking to somebody. So don't be afraid to get counseling. If we close a door on counseling, it might be one of the tools that God actually wants to use to help us find freedom through forgiveness in. The third thing is this, is we've got to practice this repeatedly. Like oftentimes asking uh, God to help us forgive somebody is going to take multiple times. Like maybe if you, if you need to ask for forgiveness, you just need to do that one time with, with somebody. But if you're asking God to help change your heart, I'm telling you, sometimes that can be over and over and over again. I, I remember I, I felt wronged by something that someone did to me and my family when I was 12 years old. And it took me until I was 26 years old to get over it, to, to actually forgive. And I haven't forgot a thing. I could tell you all the wrongs that were done to me and to my family. But you know what? At some point I said, I have to let this go. And I had to pray. I didn't pray one time. I didn't pray 17 times. I prayed over a hundred times that God would change my heart towards someone else. And sometimes you're, you're going to have to do the hard work of repetition. But don't be discouraged. And also don't be surprised that when you are praying and repeatedly asking God to help you forgive somebody, that he starts doing that in your life. Don't be surprised because that's probably what's going to happen is you're going to continue to ask and God's going to continue. And you're like, man, I used to think about that so much more and now I don't. That is God reshaping your heart and your mind to be a person of forgiveness, which leads to something we've been talking about this whole morning, a fourth way for you to find freedom and find forgiveness. And that is through constant prayer that God will actually change your heart. You know, maybe you're saying, well, Jonathan, I just want to tell you, like, the thing of it is, is like, I was right though. Like, I, they were wrong and I was right. So why do I need to change my heart? Well, I, I'll tell you this. The, the point of this passage is not, is that we don't get what we were owed. We get mercy. We get something that we didn't deserve. And maybe that other person deserves something horrible for what they did to you. But ultimately, are we going to start acting as the judges and the justices of our world? Are we the ones that can really bear to carry that weight? I'm not so sure we can. And that's why we have to continually go back again and again and ask the Holy Spirit, would you please change my heart? You know, I, I even think of the, the, uh, the young adult girl who was texting me and asking, how do I release forgiveness towards this person. I want to, but I can't, Jonathan. 
And uh, part of it was that, you know, they, they just kept popping up on their social media every day. And I said, hey, you're not even in relationship with that person anymore. Like, mute them, unfollow them, whatever you need to do. Like, th- you don't need to see that each and every day. Like, just, just do that. But whenever that person pops into your head, it always comes at the most randomness of times. Like, you're not, you're not ready for it. But, man, all of a sudden you're like, oh, that frustrates me. And then you get frustrated with yourself that you haven't forgiven them yet. And that's where I would encourage you, right then and there, turn that frustration into asking God to help you forgive. It can just be as simple as, God, I'm so sorry. I know that we've literally already talked about this like six times today, but God, would you just help me forgive that person? What they did was wrong, but I need your help. Would you help me forgive? And again, you'll be surprised at how God starts to reshape your heart. And ultimately, this is the most important thing I could tell you today, is that if you want to be free, you have to look to Jesus and his forgiveness of your debt to be able to forgive others. You see, if you were to take my phone and you were to break it, there would be a cost associated with my now broken phone. Phones are very expensive. Smartphones are very expensive. And so there's a couple of options. Number one, if you broke it, you could pay for it or I could pay for it. Or maybe you've got a rich parent who could help you pay for it. Or I live with the brokenness of my phone and I just have to deal with it. And here's the thing. We we deserved to live entirely broken lives set apart from God. We dug a hole, dug a ditch with our own sin that separated us from God. But Jesus loved you so incredibly much that he sent his son to forgive you. And forgiveness is never cheap. Forgiveness is never free. But forgiveness always costs somebody something. And Jesus chose for you to put it all on his back so that you could be free. And so now, if you want to be a person who lives by the values of Jesus, he is inviting you today to receive his forgiveness so that you can be a person of mercy. You can be a person of grace and you can be a person who releases forgiveness to others, even those who do not deserve it because you and I didn't deserve it. But Jesus said we were worth it. And we do this by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I would encourage you today if you've never done it before, to ask God to to forgive your own heart. And secondly, to ask God that he would help you be a person who would help forgive others. Maybe it's even today that you, this person you have been thinking about for this whole message, that you want to start your process of forgiveness. Maybe it means counseling. Maybe it means prayer. Maybe it means you got to pray over and over. Maybe it means you need to just remember how much Jesus has forgiven you. There's there's so many different options. You got to dig deep to know exactly what happened and, and dig into that pain. But ultimately, Jesus wants you to be free. He invites you to forgive by the power of his Holy Spirit. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you for my friends engaging online with your word. I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would help us to be a people who live out your kingdom value, to be people of forgiveness, not by our own strength, but by the power of you living and dwelling inside of us. I thank you, God, for your spirit. I thank you for your forgiveness. Help us, Father, to live like you have called us to live. In Jesus' name, if you agree with that prayer, would you say amen? Thank you. Would you join us by singing and engaging in song? with 
Thank you so much for engaging with us online. Just like forgiveness can be so incredibly challenging for us 
to uh, accomplish in our own hearts and in our own minds. The same can be true for us when it comes to releasing our resources back to God, to giving back to him what he has given to us. Sometimes we can feel like, oh, what am I getting back for this return on this investment? And, and I think it's a fair question and it's not a wrong question. But what I would say is, God is not just after an, an amount of money for you. God is ultimately always after captivating our hearts. And so that is why he asks us to give of our first fruits back to him. And we would love to invite you to be able to partner with what God is doing through Calvary Assembly, making a difference here in our city and across the world now with our online church. And so if you would like to be able to uh, partner with us, you can go right to our website at rcalvary.org forward slash give, and you can make your secured donation. I just wanna thank you so much for uh, engaging with us, for growing with us. You are a part of our church, and I am so thankful for you and grateful for you. We are praying for you and all that is happening in our world right now. For the young families, I think of you as you are preparing to go back to school or what school is going to look like. Our church is praying for you. We are with you. We are here to support you and we love you. Thank you so much for joining us.